right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our second MOA webinar. Um, today, we have a fun-filled webinar for you to continue on top of our education that we've started. Um, on behalf of MOA and our commitment to promote and champion diversity, equity, and inclusion in intercollegiate activities and sports, this session, part two, is in challenging, challenges facing diversity officers today and focusing on the changes since March of 2020 when the ABID designation was implemented. Full-time positions as well as designees have been created on a number of campuses since that time. Also, we've had requests of longtime diversity officers to begin to do trainings for those that are continuing in this space and those that have been given the ADID designation. This webinar is going to discuss the challenges that are currently being faced by campus diversity officers and the ways in which they can begin to approach them. Now we have a fun-filled panel for you, but first we would like to do a little bit of housekeeping. We had a, questions that were submitted in advance, but if any questions are to come up throughout, you can feel free to put them in the chat and I'll continue to add those to the previous questions. We may not get to all of them, but we will be able to send follow-ups after and so important questions that were not able to be addressed, we will do so then. As well, if there's any questions that are more geared towards our upcoming webinar, we'll hold those questions until then. Also, um, we are going to have all the questions that were submitted previously work in that same format, okay? I wanna first introduce our moderator for today, Renee Edwards, who comes to us from Mississippi Valley State University, where she serves as the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Compliance and Student Athlete Affairs, as well as the Senior Woman Administrator she comes to us with a wealth of experience. Edwards currently oversees all the day-to-day -day operations of the athletics department, serves as the university liaison to the NCAA and oversees development of the student athlete academic support services and compliance. She brings a wealth of experience from prior institutions, such as South Carolina State University, University of South Carolina, Virginia Tech, University of Iowa, and so on, okay? I am handing it over to a pro here, people, and she has got two panelists with her that are going to impress. So please tune in later on when you get ready to, if there's any questions, please give them someone to engage with by turning on your cameras if you see fit. And at this point, I will hand it over to our moderator, Renee Edwards. Thank you, Angel, and welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here today. I'm uh, very excited for these two uh, wonderful um, young ladies that I'm working with this afternoon. Uh, first up is gonna be Reese Lovelace. Um, she is the Assistant Athletic Director of Student Athlete Development at the University of Maryland and the founder of RBL Theory LLC. Um, brilliant mind for uh, consultations and an effective leader in engaging speakers. Um, Lovelace you know, has facilitated workshops with athletic industry leaders as well as administrators and students on the topic of identity, race, and sexual um, orientation. She has spoken to a number of regional and national platforms, including the Nike headquarters and women leaders in college sports convention, association applied uh, sports psychology, and the National Academic Association of Academic and Student Athlete Development Professionals in 4A regional conferences. Um, Lovelace is an alumnus of Old Dominion University, Hampton University, and she currently again, uh, serves as the Assistant Director of Student Athlete Development at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, next up, we have um, Holly Roki, who's now recently uh, acquired the position of Senior Associate Athletic Director at Pomona Feister uh, Athletic and Physical Education Department out in California. Um, Holly um, serves as the day-to-day -day operations officer um, there, helping with the decision-making of the Physical Education Department. For in athletics. She also serves as the liaison uh, for designated Pomona and Pfizer campuses, offices of athletics, and will serve as uh, with specific focus on internal operations, compliance, and student athlete development. Um, previously, 
Uh, Holly served as Assistant Athletic Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Student Success at Rennell College um, in Iowa. Uh, the athletic um, administrator role was specific focus on diversity, equity, and inclusive excellence through campus collaborations in pursuit of the part development of professionals and athlete success. Um, her work has reached across campus in areas such as student health and wellness, academic success, the Council of Diversity and Inclusion, and the President Initiative on Reliance and Wellbeing, addressing opportunities and gaps in influence retention. Um, prior to Grinnell, she served as the Director of Media Relations for Southern California Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. She coordinated conference programs and events, administered the League Awards Program, and promoted student athlete development by leading the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Holly holds a master's degree in kinesiology and sports management from the University of Dakota, South Dakota. Holly graduated from California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks, California, with a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership. And she was also a standout athlete at the school and a member of the Athletics Hall of Fame at Ventura County Sports. And again, welcome, Holly and Reese. Um, to get started, um, both of you have had experience in leading diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and programs. Tell us what drives you to the space and why you continue to be leaders in this area. How do you want me to go first? <laughs> I see, see you directing me. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here and engage in this conversation. Um, what drove me to be in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion really starts as a, at an early age of watching college basketball and witnessing not a lot of women being represented as coaches. Um, and as my professor from Hampton University will tell you, any paper I submitted was about how do we navigate and increase opportunities for women in sport, not just to be able to play, but also to be able to coach. Um, and really from there, just kind of expanding um, my thought process on, you know, going to a historically Black college and being surrounded by people that look like me, um, and then really transitioning to working at predominantly white institutions and seeing there be a lack of minorities in the space and my students saying, wow, I didn't know I could be in a position like you. I thought we were only relegated to coaches. And so that started to open my eyes that we need to start to have some conversations about how race plays in sports, but also how sexual orientation plays in to students grooming um, and growing in their uh, ages of college, right? And so for me, it really has been about some of my own experiences, but also hearing from students that I work with day to day to think about how we need to improve this space. I mean, really, the students are why I continue to be in this space. I think they need to know that when they come to college, we have their best interest at heart. And though we are dealing with a lot of societal issues, um, our students are dealing with that too. And so how do we recognize and honor those things in this space um, without missing a beat? So for me, that's why I continue to stay in this space. Yeah, and um, I want to say the same thing. I want to acknowledge everyone that's here and thank everyone um, for leaning into this conversation. Um, I uh, very similar, right? I um, at a very early age, uh, I played soccer in Iowa, which um, it was just an unknown, right? Like it was an unknown sport. I had no idea women played soccer um, until I was much older. Um, it was a space that I felt I could be authentically myself. Um, one of very few spaces, right, within sport as a woman of color, um, a girl of color at the time, right? Um, and so it was just a natural fit. Um, the diversity, equity, inclusion piece um, really became a space that I essentially ran toward, um, it, it felt right. It felt like it, there was a need. Um, it felt to me like the conversation needed to be a little different. Um, we needed to have different conversations in this space. We needed different representation um, in the space of, of the work right at this level. And so it's something that, um, I was able to, to run toward. Um, the position at Grinnell College is one of the first positions. It's a division three institution in Iowa. Um, it was one of the first institutions in the country that had a diversity, equity, inclusion position within athletics of any division. Um, and so that's exciting, right? To be able to um, continue uh, the work that I have um, 
have a passion for um, and in a way that was supported um, and really grow a position to reach all facets of, of the campus of the larger community. And then, um, you know, even within my, um, as I um, was onboarding, I had a lot of conversation about Iowa is, is central. It's a central location, right? And so I talked about a circle of influence and I've been able to have conversations with various institutions at the NCAA level um, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Um, the NCAA um, laid out a plan to advance racial equity. And they identified, I guess, eight action items to address you know, racial justice and equity at the national office and amongst the, um, the membership. And last summer, uh, we saw an increase of diversity officers within college athletics. What do you see as an immediate challenge of these positions as they are onboarded within their, you know, within their universities and institutions? You want to go? I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you jump in because I know we had some some conversations about this piece. So, yeah. So I want to start by saying I think there's there's different conversations here. The true intent of the ADID position um, was to disseminate information, to to share communication from the NCAA or a larger space to um, the professionals on campus, right, in a very personal way. Um, um, with a professional that's with working within that space. And so I wanna honor that as the true intent of the ADI, ADID position, and also acknowledge the fact that it's expanded, right? Um, there has been a growth of um, positions that have been created that um, work within the DEI space, um, within athletics. And so um, with that, I think there's, right, just off the bat, I think there's, a misunderstanding of what the expectations are, right? Um, is this an ADID position that my, my, it's a designation and my role and responsibility is to disseminate information or am I working in a space to um, educate and empower student athletes by educating and empowering the coaches and professionals with, um, that work with them and um, right, growing that, growing that relationship throughout campus and throughout the larger community. And so I just think that the, um, the lack of clarity and expectations um, could be a barrier. Um, also um, support, and we've talked about this, right? Organizational structure um, and reporting lines are crucial. Understanding what this position is and how, what it, what it is intended to do, right? Who it is intended to serve and what the purpose is, is crucial in understanding how this position should be um, fit within the organizational structure of the athletic department and the larger institution. Um, if this person is responsible for the words and actions um, of, and is going to influence the words and actions of the athletic director, right? A position, you know, three, four, five levels down hidden under a student services position, reporting to a senior associate athletic director for student services as a director position may not be the best fit, right? So we have to align the intentions with the organizational structure and reporting lines of, of the position. Um, Risa, I'll let you talk about resources and, and the education as well. Yeah, and so I think the resources is a huge piece of this, right? So when you look at your athletic department, there's really no unit that is one person. And so when we think about how do we continue to build and, and really enhance this space, you can't necessarily just hire one person. They have to be able to have a staff that can go out and really facilitate workshops, work with coaches, right? There's so much work that can be housed in this space um, that we have to think about what the human resources look like. And then I also think there's a financial component that comes with this as well, whether it's bringing people in to speak to your students, y'all going out and doing action with the community and the campus. So I think there's a lot of uh, resources that need to be given to this space. I also think that there needs to be an understanding of the culture of the department, right? And so when you're hiring somebody to come into this space, are you asking them to do a climate survey so that they can, with their own eyes and ears, understand what the culture of the department is that then drives the decision-making of how does this person in this unit really influence the change of the culture, which also will help in, um, change with the inclusion and equity of it. Um, and then the last piece I'll add is, if this person is not known to your campus, a challenge for them could be understanding what the, the campus culture is, 
but also the commu community culture. Um, and how, how do our student athletes fit in, in those spaces? I mean, what may be their challenges overall? Okay. Um, you know, when we were, you know, kind of meeting, you know, on the topic earlier, so that we we're going to take like a 1.0 approach, we're going to like the 5.0 um, and, and kind of deep diving into, you know, some of these areas. And I know you just, you know, talked about, you know, what needs to be done. But how do individuals that say are new to these positions really go in and, and deep dive and have these conversations with the administration to start the conversation and support what they're needing in these roles? I mean, I would kind of jump in real quick just because I mentioned it. I really think, to Holly's point earlier, this position has to be positioned right under the leadership or right aligned with leadership. And whether that's your athletic director and a dotted line to the president, like there needs to be that overall connection. And then secondarily to that is grabbing the campus because most campuses do a climate survey, but also there needs to be one done within the athletics because you can't really truly transition and transform a space if you don't know what the space is dealing with, right? And again, we're talking about it coming from multiple lenses. There's a lens with the students, there's a lens with potentially the staff and then a lens with your coaches. So looking at all of that data and putting together a report and a recommendation and plan for the leadership to come together and say, this is this is what we're dealing with and here are the actions that we need to take to make this a better space. Um, so those are some of my initial thoughts, but I'll throw it to Holly for anything additional. Yeah, I think um, a concrete example would be great here. I think when I started at Grinnell um, four years ago, we were um, responding to a, a directive from the president um, to create a policy that was specific to student athletes um, that um, would be punitive in, in its um, outcomes um, against right, several infractions. The issue on a Div division three institution, right, is that um, our student athletes are student athletes always, right? But coaches don't have access to these athletes always. Mm -hmm. um, there is a limited time in which they are c truly considered to be participating participants in athletics. The rest of the time, um, two thirds of the year, the school year, they are students first and foremost, as they are the whole year, um, but really have very limited interaction intentionally with their coaches. Mm -hmm. What would happen um, with the, the measures that the president was requesting is if a student and a student athlete were in the same space doing the same thing, they would have completely different outcomes. That's dangerous, right? Now let's put any identity on that student athlete. And now, right, we're looking at the student receiving educational outcomes and the student athlete re receiving punitive outcomes, right? So if I, in the spring, right, and I'm a fall athlete in the spring, I could lose fall participation as an athlete, right? Like it just doesn't seem to align. So one of the first things that I, I, I walked into this situation, this was a conversation that had been happening within the athletic department for months. And I came in, I said, oh, this is problematic, right? And so um, I went to the athletic director and I said, this is problematic. He said, I know, but this came from the president, right? And so then what do we do? Um, so in that, I knew I needed to align myself outside of our department. And so I went, um, we, um, have a partnership with student affairs. So I went through student affairs, right? Because we're talking about student, student judicial outcomes. And so I went to student affairs and they're like, yeah, we really, we really don't have a say in this. Um, and so I went to the chief diversity officer who reports directly to the president. And I said, here's the situation, right? So this is my first conversation with our chief, chief diversity officer um, after, after I was hired. And the chief diversity officer obviously understood, right? So what this is saying is that you have to align yourself and be able to work outside of athletics, right? In the greater good for the, the institution and the department. Um, and in doing so, right, I was able to make connections all along the way. I was able to make connections with student affairs. I was able to make connections um, through the office of the chief diversity officer um, and then had some influence on the president. The chief diversity officer literally walked from our meeting to the office of the president and said, this is not happening. We are not doing this. We are not going to support this. That was the end of the conversation, right? Um, 
in the meantime, my athletic director had warned me, you know, tread lightly, right? <laughs> you're brand new here. You're talking about something the president had told us to do, right? And we've been working on for months. And to me, right, the work that has to be done has to be done regardless. And so I often say that, um, you know, if this is going to cost me my job, I am that passionate about it, um, doing the right thing that it's going to cost me my job. And, and I have students that often say, well, that's coming from a place, place of privilege. Yes, it is. It's also coming from a place of responsibility, right? The responsibility that I have in this role is to do the right thing, right? And to make sure that others understand what that is and where it's coming from. And so um, I, it's often in conflict, <laughs> right? With, with um, what people expect, um, but that's right. It's, it's, it's really just aligning yourself with with um, people that can support your voice um, in spaces and in ways that you may not necessarily be have access to initially. Thank you, Holly. That that, that is so true, um, especially I guess you know, like I said, the administration. You know, the president. Um, Reese, can you talk about how do you get that voice with the coaches and having that that conversation for them to get buy in um, in those situations as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the coaches is, is really the space that we need to tap into. I think it's a space that becomes tricky, especially when you're at the power five level, right? When you are talking about coaches that are making millions of dollars and, and they are probably the most, uh, the highest paid person in your state, right? Even above your governors and, and your representatives, right? So you're talking about, from a financial space, very powerful people, Um but this is also where we need coaches, and, and I'm going to name drop some folks like Don Staley, right, who, who have the power and have the voice to work with their peers to say, this is why we need to have the conversation. I think oftentimes we look at athletic directors to lead these conversations or on the reverse side, look at students to lead these conversations. But at some point, there has to be a peer-to-peer -peer responsibility. And so we can give them all the trains in the world. But if you are not ready to buy into inclusion or equity, like, there's really no, no hope to, to really move you forward. And that's the sad reality that I think we're seeing today, right? We've seen a lot of coaches make statements over the last year. But the reality is you're not really having a conversation with your students or supporting your stu students when they say, oh, I'm gonna go out to a protest or I'm gonna write to my legislator, right? Like we have to, we have to as administrators define what is the expectation on coaches moving forward in this space? Is this a conversation that's in their performance review, right? Like we have to have some accountability on, on their behalf now because this isn't going away. I mean, this has been here for hundreds of years for many of us that are, are, are having this conversation. And I think that the summer of 2020 just started to open the eyes for other for other folks because they were forced to watch and witness it. Um, and so I think we need to hold them accountable. And, and the best way to hold them accountable is to really put it within their performance review or whatever measures you have within your campus um, to say, like, we're no longer going to tolerate you all being silent or you not having conversations with your students because our students are getting lost. And I think this is why we're starting to see this cycle of students, particularly Black students, go to historically black colleges, or we're starting to see students transfer out of certain institutions because they recognize that they're not being supported um, overall. Okay. Um, you both have hit on, I guess, a lot of topics with, you know, not only having to work within your department, you know, you got to branch across campus, you know, hook into the community and what they're doing and having these conversations with the coaches. Uh, but let's take a step back and say, you know, again, a lot of new individuals, in the space, you know, when given the designation, what type of training should they be looking forward to or, or trying to find to make sure that they have these tools that are needed to have these conversations that you, you all just talked about? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think um, what we're talking about, I really want to be clear that we're talking about practitioners, right? We're not talking about people that um, hold an identity that are doing the work of that identity, right? So um, there's, there's a clear difference in this conversation. When we talk about pr practitioners that are doing the work across the broad spectrum of right? justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, so what's available, right? There's, there are certificates available. There are degree programs that are avail available. Um, there are workshops, right? Like this and others that are available. Um, and sitting in and, you know, obviously there's books and things like that, that's one piece of the work, right? Um, 
what is really important is that we um, put our understanding and our learning into action, right? We test it. Um, I'm a big fan of using a lab, a science lab as an example, right? We come up with a theory, we have a notion, we have to test it. We have to, we have to use what we've been, what we've been given. Um, and it's important to the spaces that we choose, right? Um, to have conversations in a space like this, to be able to ask questions in a space like this and not ask questions in spaces which our students are in, right? Because that can do harm. Um, it can do harm when we ask um, and when we want to do the work, we want to test I have a hypothesis or a theory um, in, in space. So we, we really need to be um, intentional about the spaces in which we, um, we begin to engage in conversations, uh, right? The NCAA, the Inclusion Forum is a great example. Um, the uh, NCAA also has Common Ground, um, which is um, uh, conversations about the intersection of um, religious uh, institutions and uh, the LGBTQ community. Um, and right, so there, there's opportunity um, that exists. I know personally um, with the title of my position, my former position, that um, I was reached out to often um, about some very concrete um, uh, examples and questions of how do we navigate this experience or this situation? And also some very broad and philosophical conversation about where do we go next? What do we do? How do we start, right? Um, and so um, just looking and reaching out, there are, there are um, um, inst uh, um, groups that are forming um, around the country. DICE is, is one of those groups that are here to inform the ADID position and other diversity in, uh, professionals within athletics. Um, and hopefully there'll be more information um, coming out about that group as well. And I would add that like jumping outside of the athletic bubble is key too, right? Like I think a lot of times us as athletic professionals only seek athletic uh, professional development. And so to me, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion is across every industry. And so you need to be understand, gaining an understanding and, and education from multiple spaces, not just the athletic lens. I think, yes, you as a professional in this seat is going to have to flip the language because we do talk different than other industries do. But I do think it's important that you're, you're seeking um, professional development training outside of the athletic bubble. And I would add, that though a person's resume says that they have all of this experience, there has to be some continued education, just like some of our other positions within athletics. Um, because if you're not continuing your education, you're stopping in this one space, and that's the only space you you know. And and things are changing every day. I mean, again, look at what, what's happening in our country. Things are really changing swiftly, and so you also have to be prepared to kind of be on, on a pivot all the time. Yeah, I know that was one of the... Uh questions that came up um, from the audience, uh, you know, is there any formal training requirements for the ADID uh, designee? And you guys kind of touched on it. I know personally, it is ever changing. I'm currently, you know, enrolled in the course with the University of South Florida uh, to get in a the diversity and equity certificate. And that has really been eye-opening um, to me with that experience, you know, talking about, you know, the requirements and needs and looking at it, not only say from within the athletics, viewpoint and lens space, but looking at it globally um, from university um, laws, you know, again, government laws, you know, what, what's uh, being said about, you know, those requirements as far as being ADA requirements, you know, what is a disability, you know, it could be a temporary that falls into the space and you have to account for those things um, being in this position um, as well. Um, what type of, you know, programs can, you know, um, individuals look to try to incorporate uh, within their space, you know, as the, with this designation? Oh, that's a fully loaded question um, because I think it depends on your space, right? Right. Um, obviously, I'm being reached out to to come in and facilitate virtually uh, right now because we still are in a pandemic, but I think it depends on, you know, what your campus needs, right? So is your campus in need of having a conversation around sexual orientation and identity? Is your campus in a need to continue this conversation around race, right? And I think right now, a lot of people are zoned in specifically on race, which I think is detrimental to our other identities that our students hold, right? And so again, it, it always goes back to this climate assessment because 
that truly tells you what what your space needs. And honestly, the the education can look different between the students and your administration and your coaches, right? So I think that also has to be acknowledged that they could be having two different conversations or needs of um, education as well. That's a good point you brought up there, Reese, that, you know, in, in applying for these positions and looking at institutions, I guess it's very important for the individuals to do an assessment of the climate of that institution to know what is actually needed and how they should direct themselves and the programming and if that's going to be a right fit, you know, for them in those conversations. What do you think about, you know, what, what's your opinion on that, Holly? So I, I want to be clear, I'm, um, I'm not a huge fan of programming. Um, and I think the reason for that is because um, we think programming is going to solve it, right? We'll throw a program at it, we'll have someone come in and do a talk, and we're good, right? Um, and this is um, kind of where I'm living right now is the space between transactional and transformational, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, if we expect transformational change, it's not going to happen right, by our, by our transactional act, act, actions, sorry, of programming, right? What does that look like? Now, can, can programming be a part of our transformative process? Absolutely, right? But we have to have that intent. Um, how do you know the difference? That's a question I get a lot. Well, how do I know the difference, right? How do, how do I measure transformation? You know the difference by what you measure. If you're counting programming, and you can say we've had 10, 10 different programs on, on these topics. Your efforts are transactional, right? We are counting our actions to, as, um, as the um, quantitative measure, right, of, of what we want to do, right, or of our goals. Transformational work, right, is done through climate and culture assessments, right? And it's done over time realizing that as an institution um, and in the work that we do, we have a new, we, we turn over every single year. We have a new group of individuals every single year in the spaces in which we work, right? So that transformation is gonna be slow, right? It has to take hold. What, what we bring in has to take hold and it has to um, be understood and be valued enough to be carried on by those within, within the spaces we work, right? So the student athletes, the coaches, the, the support staff, the professionals in that space have to hold on and carry it, right? Because every year a new group is gonna come in. So it's, it's gonna seem, right, very slow moving um, in terms of culture and climate, um, but that is how we measure uh, transformational action. Yes. Um, that it is. And, and again, you talk about, again, I guess that culture and, and, and it's slow moving, but I guess, how do you, how do you really measure that impact? You know, get that return on investment, you know, do you do surveys, um, polls, you know, how do you go about, you know, again, trying to measure that within the department to try to bring about those conversations or, or know which direction to kind of head, head in? I mean, I do, I, I do think it is in some ways survey data. I think it's also focus groups, right? Um, I know our students are over surveyed from a, a number of individuals, but I do think that it's helpful to have that data that you can go to and look at the numbers. But I also think it's important to actually go out and do focus groups and have conversations with individuals because now you're getting to understand their experience um, and they're verbally telling you these things, right? So I think to me, that's really important and something that no matter what you're doing, even outside of DEI, I think is important to, to recognize when you're working with the populations that we do. Um, so, so that to me is, is really important. And I know Holly had something she was about to jump in and say, so I'll turn it over to her as well. No, I just, right, I think I, I always, um, I throw the wrench in, right? I, I, want, I want everyone to understand too that um, when we do this and when we measure, numbers may not always decrease. Right. So when we do a really great job of bystander training and we have a really great understanding of of um, the office of Title IX, what we see is we see an increase in reporting. Right. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in that we don't right it, as related to an increase of events. Right. What it could be signaling is that really there's an increase in understanding 
of mm-hmm. support, right? And now there's a higher utilization of that support than there was previously, right? That is a win. It may not feel like it, right? But for our students to understand that they have resources and they can seek seek, um, seek support um, in spaces may, may be an increase in usage of what could per- be perceived as um, a negative, um, a negative outcome, right, in terms of, of utilizing data. And I think that's, that's very important in, in understanding, um, I guess, what's needed and even making that ask uh, for budgets. Because I think in a, in a sense that a lot of these positions have been created or the offices have been created, but really, where's the funding, you know, for those positions and, and the program? So, having being able to do the deep dive to collect the data to have those conversations can help you see what is needed to now address those issues so um do we again try to put the pressure say within the athletics department to try to help with this funding to create you know these programming um tenants or do we again move across campus or community resources in helping with that so what would you I mean, say I think, this go ahead i think go ahead. it's all of the above right like you know, we are all suffering through COVID right now. And so budgets have ebbed and flowed for a lot of people. And so I think, yes, I think the athletic department should find financial resources to support these positions and the work. But I also think it's important to have that collaboration with campus and the community because when you're building that, it's not all coming out of one pocket, right? And it shows that we are all in this together. And as Holly mentioned, like her direct line and support with the chief diversity officer of her former campus, right? Like those are the relationships we we need to have within athletics because if we're aligned with campus, that does all of us even that much better. So I do think that, you know, there there should be ways in which we're finding funding for all from all of these resources. Um, And even thinking about our donors too, like I know that becomes a, a huge concern of when we're having these conversations or these coaches are making statements and the students are making statements, like what effect that gives on the donor. And I always like to say, like, let's flip our mindset. Like we may have donors who now want to actually donate to us because they are seeing us have our students use their platform and their coaches are using their platform. So I think there's always this negative negative stigma that when we have these conversations openly um, that we're going to lose donors, but I always like to think that they, that we may be impacting donors that we've never seen before. Um, so I think that needs to be considered in this conversation as well. Okay, um, Reese, uh, you coming from? I said they say they call it the the real HU, talking about the the HBCU space, and myself being a product of the oldest HBCU in the South, Shaw University. Um, are these conversations different? Um, on an HBCU campus or limited resource institutions, are are we still talking the same thing? Again, I think, you know, the conversation can look different, but it it depends on, again, the context, right? The the outcomes that this department is trying to have. And I'll say I've done some some work recently that hasn't talked about race in the HBCU space. They've come and said, can we have conversations on sexual orientation, which is still not a conversation many HBCUs want to be having right now. And so I think the work is the same, but the context and the conversation may look different. And this is where I'm prompting us that are at um, predominantly white institutions to think about for the last year, we've only focused on race. And so we're, we're continuing to miss our other students who have social identities that may not be accepted in in our society. Um, and And that even lends into, as Holly mentioned, like the religious piece of it, right? Like we're, we're, our Muslim students are going through Ramadan right now. Are we considering, you know, the struggle from um, a sustainability point right now where they're not able to eat for a, a number of hours? Are we taking those things into consideration? So I think um, we have to dig ourselves out of this hole of specifically talking about race and really thinking about the landscape of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, that is so true. Yeah, we just saw a recent um, incident of that uh, with, the NCAA volleyball championship where BYU's game was moved uh, to Saturday instead of Sunday to play because of their religious tenets uh, within um, the institution. And so again, as we're saying, the conversation is more than just race. You know, we're looking at all other, you know, areas. And Holly, you know, what are, what are some things that, you know, again, having those conversations with coaches, 
that they need to take into consideration when looking at their student athletes. And again, focusing on the conversations of take travel and things of that nature. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think um, our coaches do a great job of understanding, right? Who's in front of them. Um, I, I encourage them to dig deeper, right? To get to know um, their student athletes. Um, and it's more than an open door policy, right? It's, it's going and having conversations in spaces where the athletes are um, and poten potentially even have, are, are more comfortable. Um, sometimes really difficult conversations happen in the offices of the coach, right? And if we think of sometimes the setup um, in those offices, they're, it's not conducive to a comfortable conversation um, between two people. Um, and so, right, being really intentional about where we have the conversation, having the conversations, um, um, leaving open um, space for um, athletes to come and to reach out to any coach, right? Um, to have a conversation or any professional within the athletic department, um, but also, right, create an expectation, right? Do we do mental health check-ins with our athletes? Do we understand that, do we um, give the expectation that we, they can take a mental health day if needed, right? Um, do we give the expectation that they should be taking mental health time, right? Um, and, and it can be worked into, the time that we already have created um, and the spaces that we have already created for our athletes, but we just have to be intentional about um, our messaging, right? And our expectations um, in that. I think, um, you know, some of the things coaches need to be aware, aware of, right? In, in, um, uh, and athletic professionals, right? Uh, is the spaces in which we're traveling, right? And what that means mm -hmm. for athletes. Um, you know, if, if we're going to different states, if we're looking um, uh, in different areas, right, what that means for the athletes and their identities to be able to, and I call it, um, to get off the bus or step off a plane into those spaces. What does that mean? Um, that's one of the things I'm actually working with our high school um, about. So, you know, we're in rural Iowa and um, stepping off a bus into a very rural space can be very scary. Right, and so I want our coaches and our and our the athletes that are surrounding um, our students of various marginalized identities to be able to understand what that looks like, right, um, and what being an ally in that space looks like, um, and supporting supporting these students and their identities. Thank you. And now you brought up, I guess, the students, and we've talked about the administration, talked about AD, the university. Um, the community, but our biggest constituents are the student athletes. So how do you manage, um, you know, the lack of uh, student engagement and what stops, um, what steps would you say you would take to encourage the participation? Because, you know, sometimes it's like pulling teeth to kind of get students involved. Um, but what does that look like when engaging the students? So I see Holly muted, which means she want me to go first. Um, I, I honestly don't think there's a lack of engagement, right? I think there's a lack of understanding. Um, I think our students want to be engaged, but if they don't feel supported by their administration, that is when it looks like a lack of engagement. Um, I, would, I would say that over this last year in particular, I've seen a lot more students that I work with, but also just students being retweeted on social media that are actually trying to have the conversation but when they don't feel the support of the administration or they feel like the administration and the coaches are leaning into them to have this conversation first, that is going to drive our students to no longer want to talk. And so again, there's always to me this pressure on the students to, to make the first statement or the students to drive the conversation. And the reality is like they're 18 to 24 year olds, right? And so we can't put that much pressure on these students who are really just trying to survive day to day as a student and then an athlete, to then also carry this burden to, to lift, lift this for an institution. Um, so I think we have to kind of reverse this playing field. Um, but I do think that students are actively engaged and are out here protesting on the front lines. And I think, I think we see that, but I think when it comes back to their institution, they just don't trust some of their administration and their coaches. Yeah, I'm gonna, I, actually, I'll jump in there, right? And this uh, recently happened, right? And, and it's like com common 
um, phrase that we're using is the country is so divided, right? And um, there are people on both sides. And I recently heard someone say this, we talk about, you know, like, how do we, how do we engage? And how do we have, how do we represent, right? All these varying viewpoints um, when everyone's so divided and it's so polarizing. And um, I was entering that space thinking we were talking about basic human rights. That for me has been the conversation, right? Do I have a right to breathe? That is not polarizing. The fact that it is, it should not be. The fact that it is, is problematic, right? So when I hear someone say that, if, I, if I'm a student athlete, 18 to 22 years old, right? I'm thinking, this is not someone I can trust. This is not someone I can go to. They do not get it. They do not get it, right? So this is not someone I'm going to lean into, right? And if you, are, if you are then turning around and are a big proponent of a BIPOC group, right? Um, or, or any other identity group, right? No, thank you, right? That is not, you, you don't understand what this conversation is. Um, and so we see then, right, that other resources on our campuses are being utilized for that purpose, right? And so we need to know that if I am not the resource my students need, then I need to be able to be aware of what other resources exist so I can support them in leading into those resources. That, that is so true, um, so true. Um, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Paige wants to know, um, to include more individuals other than race, what is the appropriate um, terminology to include DEI? Is it underrepresented? Um, what do you all recommend in having those conversations and terminology? I'm gonna toss that to Holly, because <laughs> I'm, I'm torn, but I'm, I'll let you jump in for that one first. You're muted. Seriously, after a year and a half, like, come on, <laughs> come on. That's the one thing that people should know. Um, I think it's tough. I think, I, I think we're, I think we agree on this is it's tough. Um, and to me, it goes back to some of our initial points in understanding the culture and the climate um, of your space that you're in, whether it's your institution or your department, um, and, and just understanding, leaning in and understanding what fits. Um, I often use marginalized. Um, I often use intersecting identities um, because I think and in, in interchangeably use them um, depending on the conversation and how it fits. Um, but I... I Again, I, I am in full agreement that this is not just a conversation about race, right? And so I want to make sure that um, in the work that I do and in the conversations that I have, that I that people can hear and understand one what they need to hear and understand, but I'm also challenging them to broaden um, what they're hearing and what they're what they're a part of. Um. We said earlier how, you know, this designation has come about and, you know, it's been piling on and a lot of individuals um, had it added to their already full plate. Um, can you give some advice for balancing the work related to DEI and the actual job responsibilities for those who aren't solely focused on the DEI uh, work? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to say take your time, right? Like, I think this work is heavy to carry. And if you're carrying it alone, it's an uphill battle, right? And so I think you have to take your time and I think you have to educate yourself. If, if, if you're being the designee, right? Like you may have never walked into this space and you may have been asked because your identity or as Holly likes to say, the melanin in your skin is different, right? And so people are like piling this on your plate. And so if it's being added to you, I think you need to take your time and understand the responsibilities you have to the people in your community, um, especially the, the community that is marginalized, right? Um, but also taking taking that moment to recognize that we're not we're on we're not only in a space of like thinking about this from an athletic lens, but like when our students walk off of our campus, they may have to face this in a different reality. And so what is that reality? And unfortunately that means that you as the practitioner you as the designee, you gotta watch the news. You gotta know what's happening, not only in your community, but maybe even the communities that your students are coming from. Um, I remember when our last president was put into office, I was in Eugene, Oregon. 
And that is a very, very white space. I'm from DC. So like for me, that was a, a huge difference. But thinking about what was I going to do to protect my Black students that next day, right? When we had community members riding around campus, if you've ever seen the movie Purge, playing the Purge music and our students feeling threatened to walk to campus. And then the immediate reaction was to put more police presence on campus, right? So that that is not making our students feel comfortable. So, so you have to think about all of those things. And unfortunately, like I said, you're kind of on a pivot most of the time because you don't know what's coming next. And so I always think about that um, as, as, a, as an interesting moment in my career, but thinking about how that affected my students. And some of them did end up transferring because they didn't want to be in a space like that. Um, so for me, it, it, it's a progression for these professionals to understand the responsibility that they have. Yep, you're muted this time. Again, I think we have that uh, down pat by now. Um, how do you recommend someone then moving from the designation to creating a position within their departments? You know, what, what, what conversation or research or data should they bring about? So I think it's really important to have early conversations and, and set level set expectations, right? Um, this is right as, as clear as you can be about the designation and um, what its purpose is, what the expectations are. Um, and right, the moment that goes beyond being a conduit for um, transmission of information, right? It is now starting to sound like a position. And so um, we, need to, we need to look at what that is. Um, one of the things I did early on um, for um, our administrators to understand what the time constraints for, for this work is, is I actually kept uh, a timesheet, a time log. It was a digital app um, that, that I kept um, that um, allotted every amount of time in all of the areas. So I'm a, on a division three campus. And so um, my job responsibilities are broad, right? I have, I have a long, 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 long list of responsibilities, right? Um, and I don't work, right, the depth within those responsibilities because of, because there is only so many hours in a day. Um, but what I would do is I would um, anytime I switched or anytime a conversation started, I would actually, I would actually log that time. Um, and so we could look back at event management was one of my tasks and it was really high, right? It takes a lot of time to do event management. Um, but in terms of what I actually spent time on, coaching coaches was the number one area in which I spent time um, during the year and a half that I tracked my time. Um, and that was really shocking, right? What does that mean? What does that look like? What is coaching coaches, right? Um, and so um, it was really empowering um, to be able to have that conversation, um, to look at real data, right? Um, and what that looked like. And I would do this. I mean, my it would be like 10 minutes at a time. If, it, if I had a conversation with a coach, they popped their head in my office, it was 10 minutes, I would log those 10 minutes. Um, and I would be able to look Right. And it's nice that it's an app. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, and I could take notes on the side. A lot of my notes had time in them and I could do it at the end of the day. But I was very intentional about that. Um, and and then we we could have that conversation about what that looked like. Right. What is the importance? Um, you say that, you know, in my position, diversity, equity, inclusion was the largest largest part of my responsibilities, right? And so we needed to address what that looks like. Um, and then the fact that that kind of work is 24 seven, right? This work is 24 seven. I don't get to clock out, right? Um, and so um, understanding the, the need and uh, of that requirement as well. You You're muted still muted again. <laughs> Renee, we can't hear you. You're muted. I was going to say, be respectful of everyone's not time because we can go on and on and talking about this subject and the important work that we have here. Um, give us, you know, a point each about key takeaways that you would want individuals to remember or think about from our conversation today. And Reese, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I'll make mine brief. This is community work. 
right, you have to be surrounded by a community that is ready to do this work, but you also have to find the community within the campus and, 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 and the physical community of your institution. Um, so don't think that this is work that you do alone. Um, you have to be surrounded by community that is ready to move the needle. Yeah, and I'm actually just gonna add to that because that's the biggest thing, right? Like burnout would be so high if if this is one person, right? Like, um, and so adding to that, I think you have to look to build community, right? Find those in which, find the individuals that align with um, with your vision, with your plan, um, with the direction that you've been tasked with going, find individuals and grow, right? Um, and, and do it in really authentic ways. Um, and build and grow from there. Because what that does is it gives you a community of support um, as well. Thank you, ladies, so very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor actually to serve with you all today um, on this panel and lead this uh, discussion. And um, currently I'm gonna turn it back over to Angel. Thank you again for the honor and let you give some closing remarks here today. Thank you all. Um, I want to start by asking, I know that when folks registered, there was some conversation around folks kind of meeting as a group and if that was allowable. And of course that is. So if any of the participants today actually met as a group with other individuals, if you could just drop in the chat how many people were in your group so that we can kind of account for how many uh, individuals of our membership or outside of our membership that we're actually reaching. So if you could just drop that in the chat, if you have more than just yourself that's been in the room during this webinar, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also, I wanna thank our moderator, Renee Edwards. Thank you so much for taking and committing the time to continue this work. And to both of our panelists, Risa Loveless, Holly, you know, I really want to say in front of the entire group, thank you so much, because obviously, you know, they're very busy, they have a lot of work going on, and they immediately responded to a text message asking them to please come and help us serve our membership in this way with all of the great and authentic work that they've continued to do. So I wanna thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of MOA and the education committee for being able to come in and drop so many amazing nuggets for us. These two individuals are important people for you to be able to, as the membership, continue to reach out to, right? They are a wealth of knowledge. And so I just wanna push you all to continue to use them as a resource. Um, as well, this is part two of our three-part series, okay? Uh, part three will be coming soon, and we will continue to have exceptional people that we're offering up to the MOA membership. And as we look forward to that third webinar that will be taking place in May, it will focus, continue to focus on this ADID and DEI work and the designation and how those two are colliding on our campuses and in our world. But it will be titled, as to the work, where do we go from here? What's next? How do we continue to push ourselves forward? How do we continue to create amazing space for each other, for the students that we're attempting to serve, and on a national landscape with the work that's being done? So please continue to keep an eye out um, through MOA and through the listserv from Julie work and all of the things that will be posted as we get ready to prepare for that next webinar. Again, I wanna thank you guys for being present. Look forward to having you on the next one and continue to use us as a resource. Thank you all very much. <laughs>